Hello, and welcome to the lecture for Chapter 1 from the Cosmic Perspective, 9th edition. This is our introductory chapter to astronomy. As you can see, it's about a modern view of the universe. We're going to look at, well, modern facts that we know about the universe. We're going to have three sections in this chapter. We're going to look in Section 1.1 at the scale of the universe. Then in 1.2, we're going to look at the age of the universe. Then in 1.3, we're going to look at Starship Earth, thinking about how Earth is a physical object that actually moves through space and how that affects our view of space. And then finally, very briefly, we'll talk about astronomy as a field of science. All right, so let's get to it with section 1.1, the scale of the universe. What are our goals in this section? We want to know what is our place in the universe and how big is it? Well, turns out the universe is incredibly vast. To give you some idea of scale, let's take a look at this figure here. So we can see that to scale our entire Earth with a radius of about 6,000 kilometers is just a small dot on the scale of the entire solar system. All right, And in fact, it would be so small on these relative distances that you absolutely would not be able to see it. It would be much smaller than one pixel on the screen. That's what these little zoom-in boxes are showing. The zoom-in boxes do show the relative sizes between planets, which gives you some idea that, of course, Jupiter and Saturn are much bigger than Earth. The terrestrial planets, of which Earth is one, are smaller. That's these other small planets, such as Mars, Venus, and Mercury. But the distances here are shown to their own scale, and we can see there's actually relatively vast distances between these planets, just empty space. But the solar system is huge, much bigger than our planet. But our solar system is just a tiny, tiny piece of the entire Milky Way. In fact, our solar system, which is a solar named after Sol for Sun, is one of about a hundred billion potential solar systems in the entire galaxy. 100 billion. That's because there's about 100 billion stars. Now, 100 billion is a huge number. So 100 billion is equal to 100 times, well, what's a billion in scientific notation? Well, it's 10 to the 9, or 1 followed by 9 zeros. So then we can see we have two additional zeros from the 100 part. So that gives us that the size of, or the number of stars in our galaxy is 1 times 10 to the 11 stars. That's 100 billion written in scientific notation. That's how many there are, how many individual stars, many of which, probably most of which, have their own planetary systems, solar systems. Okay? Now, the Milky Way galaxy has a, basically, a diameter, because it is like a disk, it's like a circle. So it has a diameter of about 100,000 light years, which is shown here very faintly. So 100 thousand light years. Now a light year is a unit of distance. It's equal to about nine trillion kilometers. All right, so one light year is about nine times 10 to the 12 kilometers. Okay, about nine trillion kilometers. So really, really huge distance. The reason it might sound like a measurement of time is because, of course, the word year is in there, but it refers to how far light can travel in one year. So the name comes from the distance that light can travel in a year, hence it's a light year. That's important because light is very special. The way that light moves is very special, especially for physicists and astronomers. And so it makes sense to measure distances and how long it takes light to travel from one point to another. And that is, of course, based on the idea, which is very important to physics and astronomy and astrophysics and cosmology, that one or that the speed of light is a constant. The speed of light is always 300,000 kilometers per second. So the speed of light, represented by the letter C, is 300,000 kilometers per second. Okay? So that's how you end up with 9 trillion kilometers being how far light travels in, well, one year. Okay? So the Milky Way is vast compared to even that already vast number of 9 trillion kilometers because there's 100,000 of them. Okay? That's our spinning disk, our home galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, which we assume looks something like this. Okay? And we see a lot of other galaxies that have that look known as spiral type galaxies. Now, our galaxy is part of a local group of galaxies that are kind of moving in one gravitational chunk. And on this scale, we have 3 million light years. 
So across here is 3 million or 3 times 10 to the 6 light years. That's the size of our local group of galaxies. Galaxies group together like this. They'll get gravitationally attracted. They're essentially dancing together, swirling around one another on time scales of hundreds of millions of years. Okay? Now, our local group is part of an even larger group called a local supercluster. Right? This is a very large group of galaxies composed of tens of thousands of galaxies, and it has a distance of cross of about 100 million light years. Okay? So quite a bit bigger. But then that local group is just one little smidgen, one little part of the overall cosmic distribution of galaxies that looks like this. Galaxies are clustered in hot little pockets of mini galaxies together and leaving big empty voids in between. And this here is an example of the composition of the entire universe, where essentially every little pixel is a galaxy. Because how many galaxies are there in the known universe, the measurable universe? About a trillion. Unbelievable number, considering that each of those has on average some hundred billion stars. So that's our local address. That's where we are in the vastness of space. So what makes up the key components of astronomy. What do astronomers look at when they look through telescopes, whether they're visual light, radio telescopes, infrared, x-ray? What are people looking at? Well, one, of course, are stars. We have a local star known as the sun. What is a star? A star is a large glowing ball of gas that generates heat and light through a process called nuclear fusion, the fusing together of small atoms. Fusing means bringing together, okay? This is different than nuclear fission, which is a source of energy um, commercially here on planet Earth, you know, um, explored and experimented on by humans. Now, planets are another thing that we look at in the sky. Here's an example of Mars and Neptune. Mars is a terrestrial planet. Neptune is a gas planet known as a Jovian planet. What is a planet? Well, it's a moderately large because as far as there's a lot of smaller things out there, dust, asteroids, and so on, a moder moderately large object that orbits a star. That defines a planet. So a moon orbits a planet, but a planet orbits a star. It shines by reflected light, at least in the visible light spectrum. Planets do glow in infrared, just like heat signatures do. Planets may be rocky, icy, or gaseous. There are moons, which are known as natural satellites, and it is an object that orbits a planet. Here's an example of a moon, Ganymede, which is the largest moon in the solar system, larger than even the planet Mercury, and it orbits around Jupiter. There are also asteroids. Asteroids orbit around a star, or maybe pass by a star, and they are relatively small and rocky objects. Okay? They're leftovers. They're pieces of a primordial developing solar system that never got pulled in to become part of a planet, or got flung out of the solar system through gravitational interactions, so they are leftover pieces of ice or rock. Okay, but asteroids are keyed in by their rocky composition, which means they, that determines where we find them in the solar system. I make the big deal about this because comets, well, they're very much the same principle as asteroids. They're developed by the same principle as in leftovers from the formation of the solar system, but they're icy. That's all that sets them apart. They're more common because there's more icy compounds to form them than there are heavier element rocky compounds, but they also can't exist in the inner solar system because the heat from the sun would cause them to evaporate. So comets are only found in the outer solar system. And this is, we assume, an idea that holds for other planetary systems outside of our own solar system. But our current techniques only allow us to see planets, not things as small as asteroids and comets. But there's plenty of asteroids and comets that we know and have studied here in our own solar system. And comets, by the way, when we see them from spaceship, spaceship Earth, that is, when we look up in the night sky, comets are well known for their tail. Because when comets take highly elliptical orbits that bring them close to the sun, well, as I said, they start to evaporate, and that leaves a tail behind. That's essentially a tail of gas due to the evaporation. Now, the comets, if they spend too much time near the sun, will simply disappear because they'll entirely evaporate. But many comets will pass by periodically, sometimes quite irregularly, and you know, or rarely, I should say, and then we're going to have a tail each time. But when I say rarely, that's because some comets have a orbit that means that they only pass near the sun and can be visible from Earth, say, every few hundred years or even every few thousand years. Okay, now all these things, a star at the center, 
planets orbiting around, moons around those planets, leftover asteroids and comets form a solar system or a star system. But there are other things as well, bigger things. Nebula are interstellar clouds of gas or dust. They have, there's different types of nebula. There's different processes in the types of types of, of dust that exist and gas that exist within a, a, a galaxy. And they're very important to star formation. Now, there's, of course, the galaxy itself. The, the galaxy is composed of, as we talked about, hundreds of billions of stars and the nebula between them, which is what and the interstellar medium often that isn't dense enough to be properly classified as a nebula. The universe is the sum total of everything. That's all the galaxies, but that's also more mysterious things that scientists study, such as dark matter and dark energy. Okay, now let's get to the main topic of this section, astronomical distances. Okay, well, I mentioned one of them already, but there's another very important common unit used in astronomy, and that is the astronomical unit, okay? Shortened as AU, and it is the average distance between Earth and the Sun. So it's a very human-centric measurement, but it allows us to think to compare with other planets. Be like, oh, well, this planet's five times further from the sun than we are, so it would have a distance of five AU. That's really good for perspective, all right? Now, to convert over to other units, our average distance from the sun turns out to be 150 million kilometers. So one AU equals 1.5 times, and remember, million is 10 to the six, and we got two more zeros, so 1.5 times 10 to the eight kilometers. That's one AU, okay? Which is also 93 million miles, but we're gonna be using the metric system throughout these lectures. The other one, as I said, I already mentioned, is the light year. This is the distance that light can travel in one year. It is a distance, uh, is a distance measurement, not a time measurement, as I made a big deal about, because the name is confusing, I know. And it's about 10 trillion kilometers. I was rounding it to nine, because I think it's like 9.6. I can see why here we're rounding it to 10. So excuse me for any, any confusion there, 10 trillion is a good rounded number. And we'll actually see a more exact number soon. So light travels at a finite speed, as I said, just reinforcing it here in the slide. That speed is 300,000 kilometers per second. And by the way, this is a really big deal in physics. This leads to Einstein's theory of special relativity, that light always has the same speed, regardless of how fast you're going. In other words, you can never catch up with light, which is pretty strange to think about. And that's why there's things that, such as time dilation, length contraction, this idea of the space-time continuum, E equals mc squared, that all comes from this postulate, that light has one fixed speed. The value itself comes from apparently just the rules of the universe, but the principle is very interesting. All right, so how long does it take light to travel through some known distances? Well, for light to travel from the moon to Earth, that takes about one second, okay? Because the distance is about 300,000 kilometers. See, because it travels 300,000 kilometers in one second. So that tells us that the moon and Earth must be, yep, 300,000 kilometers apart, approximately. That is the average distance because the moon also has a slightly elliptical orbit, just like Earth has around the sun. That's why we say average distance. So the average distance of the Earth around the moon is about 300,000 kilometers, okay? A lot smaller than our average distance around the sun, which of course makes sense. The sun, longer, longer distance, thus longer travel time, light takes about eight minutes to travel from the sun to us. So the light we see in the sky took about eight minutes to get to us. In other words, we're looking back in time eight minutes every time we glance at the sun. Sirius, which is a star that's nearby us in our little wing of the galaxy, is eight years away, which means, or it takes light eight years to travel there, which means it's eight light years away, okay? Or about 80 trillion kilometers, because every light year is about 10 trillion kilometers. What about the Andromeda Galaxy? The Andromeda Galaxy is part of our local group, as we saw a few slides back. It's, in fact, it's the closest major galaxy to the Milky Way Galaxy. It's our neighbor. And it is two and a half million light years away, which means light takes two and a half million, million years to travel there. That's unbelievable, isn't it? Well, remember that our galaxy itself is 100,000 light, light years across. So that means light from the center of our own galaxy to reach us takes about if we're, we're not quite at the edge, so we'll, we'll say 40,000, you know, the edge would be 50,000, half of 100,000, but it takes light about 40,000 years to travel from the center of the galaxy to us. Wow, right? So if we look at our center of our own galaxy, we're looking back 40,000 years in time. If we look in the Andromeda galaxy through a telescope, because you can't make it out with the naked eye because it's faint, but if you look at the Andromeda, look at the Andromeda galaxy through a telescope, you're looking back in time two and a half million years, okay? 
amazing. Back back when you know um, you know we had uh, Homo erectus, right? Humans humans had, Homo sapiens had not evolved yet. All right. So thus we see objects as they were in the past. So look back time. The further away we look in distance, the further back we look in time. Pretty amazing idea. Now it means we're burdened to never see something you know that's current, but it also means that as we look at things, we automatically have an ability to look back in time. So there's both both pros and cons to this this nature of well the speed of light. Okay, so let's give an example. We see the Orion Nebula as it looked a hundred or fifteen hundred years ago, one thousand five hundred years ago. Right? This is what it looked like. We don't know what it looks like today, and there's no way we'll know what it looks like today. Someone 1,500 years from now would know what it looks like for us, but they can't know what it looks like for them currently. There's simply no way. Even if we sent someone somehow all the way out to the Orion Nebula, if they wanted to communicate back with us, they'd have to send us a signal. That signal would be a light signal. Uh, any, kind of, any kind of radio signal, electromagnetic wave, cellular signal, that's all light. See, we're restricted. There's no way for information to travel faster than the speed of light. This photo shows the Andromeda galaxy as it looked two and a half million years ago. When will we be able to see what it looks like now, right? Like now, currently. Well, two and a half million years from now, right? If humans are still around, they'll know what our, what the Andromeda galaxy actually looks like for our current generation, right? They don't really necessarily care, but, you know, and we'll be long dead. So if students on a planet circling a star in the Andromeda galaxy, that's a neighboring galaxy, were to use a powerful telescope to observe our solar system, they could study the human impact, or um, they could study the human impact on Earth. Is that true or false? Okay, so there's some, there's some aliens out there. They're in the Andromeda galaxy. They have a really good telescope, so they can actually see Earth, okay, all the way from the Andromeda galaxy. Right? And they want to study the human impact. Would it work? Well, no, because they would be seeing Earth two and a half million years ago, before humans evolved. False. All right, so now let's break down the light year a little bit more. Okay, so it is a very great distance. 10 trillion kilometers is a very, very long way. Remember, it's only 150 million kilometers from Earth to the sun. 10 trillion is a lot bigger than 150 million. You've got million, billion, trillion, right? So we see objects as they as they were when the universe was much younger, especially distant object, objects, because we can look at distant galaxies, well, relatively distant galaxies that are 7 billion light years away. There's even some primordial galaxies that we can see at 12 billion light years away. That means we're looking at a galaxy that is not that old relative to the beginning of the universe, because it turns out that at, at about 14 billion years, that was beyond the observable, observable universe because it appears there was a Big Bang. There was a single point, all the evidence points to it, and we can't look past that because there was nothing before that. So that's as far as ways we can look. And as we look closer and closer to that beginning, as far as we can tell, the Big Bang, the beginning of, of everything in the universe, we see, as I said, more and more rudimentary, primordial, young-looking galaxies. They, they they look different because they haven't had a chance to evolve through galactic processes governed by the laws of physics to the types of galaxies that we see that are more contemporary galaxies. Okay? Even 7 billion is more contemporary than looking all the way back near the beginning. All right. Let's break down how we can actually calculate the speed of light. Because the idea is this, right? We've got the speed, and we simply multiply it by the time. The reason this works is because let's think about the definition of velocity, right? Velocity is just distance over time. You know, if I'm, if I'm driving a car at 50 miles an hour, it's 50 miles, that's the distance, per hour, that's the time, right? If we're using a metric system, I might say five meters per second. Five meters, that's the numerator, all right? Second, that's the denominator. So velocity is distance over time, by definition. But we wanna solve for the distance part. Well, then we just multiply both sides by t, which cancels out the t on the right, so then we have that distance equals velocity times time. So if you ever want to f travel, find out how far you've traveled and you were traveling at a constant velocity, you simply need to multiply by the time you travel. So in other words, if I, if I was traveling at a velocity of 60 miles per hour and I traveled for one hour, how far will I, would I have gone? Well, you know it, 60 miles, okay? 
velocity times time is distance. Now that only works for constant velocity, but luckily light is a constant velocity. So we're simply gonna multiply the speed of light, the 300,000 kilometers per second by one year. But we can't just leave it as one year because notice the units of the speed. It has a second in it. Well, that means we need to convert the year to a second. That's all we need to do. We simply need to multiply by how many seconds there are in one year. Well, there's 365 days per year, all right? And there are 24 hours per day. So then we can cancel out the day like that. And then there are 60 minutes per hour, which lets us cancel out the hour. And then there are 60 seconds per minute, which lets us cancel out the minute. All right, so then notice then the seconds cancel over here. Seconds cancel the seconds, all right? And then the year is, is going to tell us how many kilometers we travel per year. So it's gonna be kilometers per year, which is what we wanted. That, af that af after all will be the distance we need, okay? And when we put that all together, we get 9.46. So 9.46, okay, times 10, how many, you know, how many uh, zeros do we have here? 12, so there's 9.46 trillion, all right? What if we wanted to put that in meters? Well, there's a thousand meters per kilometer, so we'd simply need two, uh, three more zeros. So then it would become nine, so this is equivalent to 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters, okay? Because sometimes you need to go back to those base units of meters when you're dealing with other units that are in meters. Can we see the entire universe? Well, no, right? Because we can't see anything before the Big Bang. So that means anything that traveled in the opposite direction from the Big Bang, right? We can't see, okay? Why can't we see a galaxy 15 billion light years away? Okay, and again, this is assuming the universe is 14 billion years old. So think about what I just said and make sure to answer this question. With, such as with all these questions, pause the video if you need to, and make sure you can answer it. But what's the best answer? Read the options. Is it because no galaxy exists at such a great distance? No, because looking 15 billion light years away means looking to a time before the universe existed. There are galaxies that exist that far away, but we can never see them. So let's reduce the size of the solar system by a factor of 10 billion. The sun is now the size of a large grapefruit, 14 centimeters. How big is Earth on this scale? Think about, think about how big Earth is to, to the entire solar system. All that empty space. Earth is really tiny, remember, relative to the solar system? So what do you think? The whole solar system is the size of a grapefruit. What's the best answer for how big Earth is? Think about the most reasonable answer. You got, it? You got a good, good feeling on this one? A ballpoint, all right? Earth would be as, about the size of a ballpoint, all right? Just a single, single tip on a pin. On a one to 10 billion scale, the sun is the size of a large grapefruit, all right? So um, I, I've, I've accidentally said that the whole solar system was the size of a large grapefruit. Sorry for any confusion there. It's the sun that's the size of a large grapefruit, okay? That's when the Earth's gonna be a ballpoint. But on that scale, we got the sun is about 14 centimeters across. The Earth then would be tiny. It would just be the size of a, of a ballpoint. So you could say maybe about a millimeter, okay? But a, about, about a tenth of a centimeter, you know, quite small, okay? And because it's about the, the Earth, Earth's diameter is about a hundredth the diameter of, of the sun, all right? Which means that its volume is about a millionth. In other words, a million Earths would fit inside the sun, okay? Um, now, the distance is quite large, 15 meters. That's because there's mostly empty space between us and the sun. Of course, there's the orbits of the two inner planets, Venus and Mercury, but again, mostly empty space. Now, the moon would be in orbit only four centimeters from Earth on that scale, right? So the orbit of the moon around Earth is smaller than the actual size of the sun. Just gives you a perspective there. All right. So on our one to 10 billion scale, it's just a few minutes walk to Pluto. Okay? Does that make sense? Because we got... Sun the size of a grapefruit, Pluto is a short walk away, right? So basically we'd have a scaled solar system that would fit in a small park. How far would you have to walk to reach Alpha Centauri? Now Alpha Centauri is the nearest star to us, all right? It's about two million, excuse me, it's about two, well, actually no, it's about four light years away. To help you, help you have a good guess here. It's about four light years away. That's the closest star, okay? So how far? You might not get this one. 
all the way across the United States. Wait, really? Check that out, right? Because we've got a grapefruit. That's the, you know, that's the sun. On that scale, the tiny little grapefruit, we then have a park with Pluto at the edge. Okay? Not, these dots are not to scale, right? So this entire thing would be like the size of a small park. You know, you think like a small municipal park. Okay? That, that, that scale, that size for our solar system. Okay? Well, the nearest solar system to us would be across the entire United States. And there'd be another little small park with nothing in between. It'd be like, it'd be like if we lived in the United States and there was just a little, one little pocket of people that lived in like one little tiny community and there was just empty barren desert until the next pocket of community in, you know, somewhere on the Eastern, Eastern seaboard. That'd be incredible, right? That'd be a, that'd be a, it, it'd be so hard to communicate between the two, right? It'd be, how, how would you survive? You, no one would travel between the two because there'd, there'd be no way to stock up and actually make the journey. Well, that's the same conundrum with astronomy, right? But even more so because the distances are, of course, you know, vast. There's huge gaps between solar systems, huge emptinesses of space filled with just very low density gas. They'd be very hard to travel across. So it gives you some perspective on interstellar travel is not easily achieved. And humans are nowhere close to having the right technology to travel to other solar systems, to other stars. Okay, it's we can barely travel within our own solar system. Now the Milky Way has about a hundred billion stars, with you know proportionally huge vastness of empty space between them. Okay, so on that same one to ten billion scale, how big is the entire Milky Way? Because remember, I mean the the distance just for you know to go from one get one solar system to another was the United States. So if we're going to have a hundred billion of those, I mean it, the the Milky Way would have to be incredibly huge, right? Well, it'd be much larger than our own planet, much larger, right? It'd be, it'd be like this, it'd scale down to something that would take up a significant portion of the solar system, right? Just the model would, right? So you'd have to scale down by a factor of another billion. So now instead of having a scale of one to 10 billion, now it's one to 10 to the 19, all right? Now we could fit the Milky Way on into, onto a football field. So now we have another scale, as we can see. On this scale, the, the distance between the Sun and Alpha Centauri is only five millimeters, about the size of, you know, actually just only five times larger than the size Earth was in our previous scale. Okay, how big would Earth be on this scale? Well, microscopic, almost atomic, the size of an atom. All right, more than a million stars would what would lie within an arm's reach on this scale. So, so suppose you tried to count the more than a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. Okay, just to give you a perspective, how big a hundred billion is, and you're going to count at a rate of one star per second. So, one star, two star, three star, four star. Okay, if you kept doing that to count up to a hundred billion, how long would it take you? Well, you just have to think about how many seconds there are, right? Like we were doing in the conversion from, you know, multiplying the speed of light by the number of seconds in a year, right? You could actually do that. Check, check it out. Run the numbers yourself. See which, see which, which one's most reasonable. A, a few weeks, a few months, a few years, or thousands of years. Well, maybe you figured it out. It's thousands of years, okay? It's just because, you know, there's just not that many seconds in a year, all right? And you need 100 billion seconds. 100 billion seconds is over 1,000 years. So... Suppose that one out of one million stars had a planet around it, okay? Which is actually fewer than we currently think. We, we, we've been finding planets around most stars, but we're going to make a very conservative estimate and say only one in, one in a million, not one in a hundred million, but one in a million stars have a planet. With that calculation, how many other planets with life would there be within the Milky Way? Okay? So... Let's see, suppose that one out of one million stars had a planet around it. How many other planets with life would there be within the Milky Way? So I think we're supposed to assume that one out of a million stars is a planet around it with life. It got cut off, right? Oh, sorry for showing you the answer. 100,000 other planets with life, okay? So let's think about this because I, I accidentally showed you the answer, but I think it's still a very interesting finding here. Cuts. One out of a million. That 
Now, that would be way too conservative for planets, as I initially read it, because, again, most solar systems appear to have planets. That's what, that's what our, our newest telescopes are telling us. However, most probably don't have life. Maybe they do. I don't know. Maybe there's even life, of life on moons within our own solar system, but maybe the conditions for life are picky, right? You have to have the right conditions for life to evolve. Okay, so we're saying only one in a million stars have planets with life. Well, then what you do is you take 100 billion, so 100 times 10 to the 9, the total number of stars, and divide that by a million, 10 to the 6, okay? Well, then you, you, know, you cancel out your 6 up here, so you have a 10 to the 3. So you have 100 times 10 to the 3. Well, 100 times 10 to the 3 is 100,000. So 100,000. So there could easily be 100,000. I mean, what if we're even more conservative? 1,000, right? But there could easily be 1,000 other solar systems with life just in our own galaxy. Our own galaxy being one of, remember, billions, tens, hundreds, a trillion galaxies overall. So yeah, it seems very reasonable there's life out there. But maybe the distances between these little pockets of life are so great that we'll never manage to communicate with them and we'll never meet each other. Who knows? So. Let's think about how big the universe is. I know we think about that a lot, but let's keep doing it. The Milky Way is one of about 100 billion galaxies. And again, I've been saying a trillion because this 100 billion is only counting the biggest galaxies. So you can easily round this up and, and more, more astronomers are doing this. So you can round it up to about a trillion. You could say about 10 to the 12 galaxies, which is just 10 times larger than 100 billion. All right, well, there's about 10 to the 11, that's 100 billion stars per galaxy. And if we say there's about 10 to 11 galaxies, that means that there's a total of 10 to the 22 stars, a number so big it doesn't have a name. That's 22 zeros, one followed by 22 zeros. That's how many stars there are in the universe. Well, that means that there are as many stars as there are grains of dry sand on all of Earth's beaches. And what's important about that analogy is think about if someone wanted to count every single grain of sand on every single beach in the world. That would actually be very unreasonable, right? No one, no team of scientists could ever pull that off, right? Well, that's the same reason that no team of scientists can ever count the total number of stars in the entire galaxy. Well, excuse me, the entire universe. It's just, it's an unfeasible number to count, right? Even with computers. So what have we learned here, right, in this section? Well, we've discussed our place in the universe. Earth is part of the solar system, which is the Milky Way galaxy, which is in the Milky Way galaxy. All right, which is a member of the local group of galaxies, which itself is part of the local supercluster, which is then part of the entire universe, which is composed of many superclusters of galaxies. The distances between planets are huge compared to the actual size of the planets themselves. On a one to 10 billion scale, Earth is the size of a ball point and the sun is 15 meters away with empty, you know, practically emptiness in between. On that same scale, the stars are thousands of kilometers away, with even more emptiness in between. It would take more than 3,000 years to count the stars in the Milky Way galaxy at a rate of one per second, and they are spread across 100,000 light years, each light year being 10 trillion kilometers. The observable universe is 14 billion light years across, billions of light years, all right, and contains over 100 billion galaxies with a total number of stars comparable to the number of grains of sand on all of Earth's beaches. So now on to the next section, section 1.2, the history of the universe. Our goals in this section are to discuss how did we come to be, right? How did the universe start? And how do our lifetimes compare to the age of the universe? All right, so the history of the universe went a little like this. There was a big bang that created matter as we know it, as well as energy, and clumps of matter started to condense forming galaxies. At some point, our own galaxy formed. Within that galaxy, the condensed gas was, had, was in a situation to condense further and form a star, and then leftovers from that matter then formed the solar system around that star. And eventually our planet cooled and formed the life-giving planet we live on. So that's kind of the process of how we got to where we are today. So our planet formed relatively, you know, not, not at the beginning of the universe, relatively newer, right? About a, it's about a third as old as the universe itself. So our planet is still still old, but not you know not as old as the entire universe. And also, our planet is composed of heavy elements that were created in the cores of stars, previous generation stars that blew up, 
and spread their matter throughout the universe that then was able to condense and form terrestrial planets like ours. So the universe is expanding from that single point, the, the initial point known as the Big Bang. All galaxies are moving away from each other because the expansion necessitates that. Tracing this motion backwards leads to a single point, right, where everything began, referred to as the Big Bang. Gravity drives collapse of matter into galaxies. So gravity is very important for explaining the principle of how galaxies form. Most galaxies formed within a few billion years after the Big Bang. So many galaxies are quite venerable, but they've continued to change, and there's a lot of interaction between galaxies. They tend to collide into each other, because unlike the huge vast emptiness between stars, comparable to the vast emptiness between planets, galaxies are relatively close to each other, and they, they can absolutely interact quite a bit. Gravity drives collapse of clouds of gas and dust to form st stars and planets. So the, really, the same physics that says that matter condenses and forms galaxies, some galaxies being disks, right? other galaxies being more, sp more spherical in shape, but that same idea of matter condensing in from gravity applies on a smaller scale to solar systems, right? but it's the same idea. Stars go through life cycles. Right? Stars are born when they get hot enough for nuclear fusion to occur, and eventually they run out of the elements they need for nuclear fusion, and then they go into their later stages, eventually dying. They're born when gravity compresses the material dense enough to start nuclear fusion, and they die when the fuel runs out, the fuel usually being hydrogen. So where did the heavier elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and iron come from? Well, I told you, right? And these, are, of course, relatively common elements here on Earth, Okay. Well, were they created in the Big Bang? Were they formed when stars are born? Are they elements manufactured by stars as they undergo nuclear fusion? Or are they elements decayed from heavier elements present, present after the Big Bang? It's the best answer. It's C, right? They're manufactured by stars. They are actually a byproduct of nuclear fusion. So one common way to think about the age of the universe and it's in its entire in its entirety for about 14 billion years is to condense it down into something called the cosmic calendar which gives a one cosmic year now one cosmic year is nowhere equivalent to one earth year but it's a, still a help, helpful way of thinking about it because we're used to dividing time up within our own well-known one year calendar so in this scale humans don't enter the picture that means humans didn't evolve until the evening of December 31st so the few, this, the few hours of the last day of the cosmic calendar is when humans evolved. That's because on this scale of 14 billion years, well, if humans have been around for a million years, well, a million years is just just minutes, right? So, you know, it's just the, the some dozens of minutes. So you can see that it means that a million years is not very long on the cosmic scale. A million years might be important for biology, certainly, right? Looking back in the fossil record, it's kind of important for geology, but ge geologists tend to talk in the scale of tens of millions of years, but astronomers talk on a scale of billions of years. So what have we learned? What's the summary from this section? Well, the Big Bang produced hydrogen and helium, okay? Nothing else. No other elements created in the Big Bang, which is why we were able to assume that all those heavier elements had to have been created in the cores of previous, previous stars, stars that, that blew up and spread that matter, okay? All other elements were constructed from hydrogen and helium, those are the shorthand for them, right, from, like from the periodic table, in stars and then recycled into new star systems. That matter gets spread around, gravitationally moved from one place to another, okay? Including our own solar system, right? All the heavy elements here on Earth formed from previous generations of stars from sometimes intense processes that the heaviest elements like gold and uranium could only have formed through in incredibly rare events like the collisions of neutron stars or even the collisions of black holes we are made of elements produced in the nuclear fusion within the cores of stars how do our lifetimes compare to the age of the universe well incredibly short on a cosmic calendar that compresses the history of the universe so some 14 billion years into one cosmic year Human civilization is just a few seconds old, right? Now, human species is much, you know, is a few hours old, but human civilization, you know, when did civilization start? Most um, archaeologists agree about 10,000 years ago. Well, that's about 10,000 years. That just, that just correlates to seconds on the cosmic calendar. And a human lifetime is a fraction, right? about a, a, you know, a 10,000th of a single second, okay? Just infinitesimally small. All right. Now, we look out into space from Earth, 
Earth is not at rest, right? Earth is orbiting the sun. The sun is orbiting the center of the, the galaxy. The galaxy is moving relative to the local cluster of galaxies. The local cluster of galaxies is moving to relative to the rest of local clusters of the supercluster. There's, there's tons of motion moving through space. So we really are a spaceship, right? We're not, a, we're not just sitting you know, on a, on a fixed, fixed platform, right? We're always moving, okay? So how is Earth moving through space? And how do galaxies move within the universe? Well, Earth is also moving around its own axis. We're rotating quite quickly, right? So con contrary to our perception, we're not sitting still. We're moving with Earth in several ways, right? At surprisingly fast speeds. So relative to our axis of rotation that goes through the poles, not the magnetic poles, but the, the geological poles, we have a speed at the equator of about 1,670 kilometers per hour. And that would be relative to the fixed axis because all velocities are relative to something. In this case, that velocity is relative to the fixed axis or the center of Earth, you could say. All right. So the Earth rotates around its axis, of course, revolving around once per day. All right. And that means that that, you know, the speed of those points has to be quite fast because the Earth is massive. Right. It's large. Now, why, why, people, why don't people experience those speeds? Well, because the resulting centripetal force from those speeds is actually tiny compared to gravity. It's about 0.3% as strong as gravity, so it's measurable, but nothing you would notice. Now, that's the first motion. The second motion, of course, is our orbit around the sun. Earth orbits the sun, all right? We know that the average distance, so the radius of orbit, is one astronomical unit, which is about 150 million kilometers. Now, that means in order to complete an orbit, because we have to be able to complete an orbit in one year or 365 days, we need to be moving at about 100,000 kilometers per hour, okay? That's just a simple calculation of circumference and over time to get that velocity, okay? Now, Earth also has an axial tilt, something we'll be talking about quite a bit later and uh, quite a bit in other chapters, later chapters. That axial tilt is 23 and a half degrees. It varies slightly over time on the scale of varying, you know, every, every, like over thousands of years it varies. But right now it's 23.5 uh, degrees. And it rotates in the same direction it orbits, counterclockwise. So as, view, as viewed from above the ecliptic plane or above the north pole of our planet. So, thought question. In space... How is direction typically specified? Let me think. Well, direction can be given by, by, stating, or by stating towards the center or away from the center. Okay? So we usually say you know, towards the center of the galaxy, away from the center of the galaxy. So our sun moves randomly relative to other stars in our, in our immediate group of stars. Okay? But that, na that neighborhood of stars, okay, is orbiting around the center of the galaxy because the galaxy as a whole is moving. You can think of the galaxy not as a rigid object that's spinning. It's the galaxy is not a rigid spinning disk because, you know, a galaxies of our type look disk shaped. Instead, think of it more like a fluid. Think of it as, as, as spinning around, but spiraling, sloshing. There's a, there's a lot of motion in the galaxy. It behaves more like a fluid, but it is still rotating. Okay. Well, typical relative speeds to the center of the galaxy are about 70,000 kilometers per hour. Okay, that's about how fast stars are moving, stars in our neighborhood are moving relative to the center of the galaxy. All right, but stars are so far away that we cannot easily notice this motion. It doesn't, we, it's hardly measurable even over many, you know, many years. Okay, and, but the orbit, you know, the motion does continue and the sun does orbit the center of the galaxy every 230 million years. All right, so 230 million years by the time that the earliest dinosaurs were first evolving, some 230 million years ago, we, we would be essentially at our same location um, you know, in the galaxy. But in that time, we've completed one complete loop coming all the way back around. Right? So we keep, we keep completing a loop around the galaxy every 230 million years, which actually does have some effects on Earth because as we move through different parts of the galaxy, we're exposed to different levels of, of, of radiation from space. And so that, that absolutely um, can affect, and scientists think that it has an effect on our atmosphere and our climate over, over a very large time scale. Notice these different speeds. Notice that we had about 100,000 um, kilometers per hour um, as, as our speed um, around, um, the, around the center of, or around the star, around our sun. And then we have a speed of about 70,000 kilometers per hour for the star around the center of the galaxy. So, why are collisions between star systems so rare? Based on something I've said a couple times, why do you think that, you know, 
solar systems colliding with each other almost never happens. Look at your options. Because the relative distance between them is so much larger than the size of the solar systems themselves. Remember, solar systems are the size of parks. The distance between them is the entire continental United States. That's not going to, I mean, it's very unlikely they would collide because there's mostly empty space between them. So how is our sun moving in the Milky Way galaxy? Well, a little bit more detail on it. A more detailed study of the Milky Way's rotation reveals one of the greatest mysteries in astronomy. Okay. Galaxies are carried along with the expansion of the universe, but how did Hubble figure out that the universe is expanding? Because it, it was Hubble's discovery with the, the well-known Hubble telescope named after this astronomer. How do you find out that the universe was expanding? Well, he looked at galaxies outside of our local group, because that was important, because in our local group, galaxies might be moving towards us or away from us, because our, our local group is, as I said, was a dancing gravitational you know, group. But further away, all galaxies he found were moving away from us. Furthermore, based on the way he was able to detect their signals, he found that the further away a galaxy was, the faster it was moving away. Conclusion, we live in an expanding universe. Okay, so are we ever sitting still? Absolutely not, right? No matter what you consider yourself re moving relative to, whether it's the center of Earth, whether it's the sun, whether it's the center of galaxy, whether it's another galaxy, there's lots of motion. All right. So what have we learned in this section about Starship Earth? Well, we, we've learned that Earth rotates on its axis once a day and orbits the sun, um, the sun at a distance of one, one AU once a year. Stars in the local neighborhood move randomly, right? Stars like us and Alpha Centauri, we're kind of getting, we're, it's like we're dancing together just like the galaxies in the local group are dancing. But all the stars in general are orbiting around the galaxy at, with an orbital period of about 230 million years. Galaxies themselves, beyond the local group, are all moving away from us. We're all expanding. It's like, it's like if you imagine a piece of bread and the bubbles within that bread, as the bread expands, all the air, air bubbles move away from each other because the bread has gotten bigger, therefore the distance between all the air bubbles is greater, okay? The more distant they are, the faster they're moving which would also hold with that analogy of expanding bread. All right, last section, very briefly, the human adventure of astronomy. What's our goal here? Well, we just want to quickly look at how the study of astronomy has affected human history. Well, there's something called the Copernican Revolution that showed that Earth was not the center of the universe. We'll discuss this in chapter three. Then there was Newton's laws about 100 years later that gave us a firm understanding of motion and gravity, which we'll discuss in chapter four. Newton's laws laid the foundation of the Industrial Revolution, as well as the foundation in, in understanding the world around us, the natural world, including the stars. Modern discoveries are continuing to expand our cosmic perspective. There are still a lot of unsolved mysteries. Throughout history, astronomy has provided an expanded perspective on Earth that has grown hand in hand with social and technological developments. Well, thank you so much for watching this lecture. I hope it has been interesting and informative. I'll see you next time.